recapping the first day of the legal tampering period of free agency for the New York Giants. We're going to find out about the two new additions to New York. We're also going to talk about the strategy that GM Joe Shane deployed in this first day. That's coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. I'm Patricia Trainer, your host, and it is a recap of the first day of the pre-free agency period, aka the legal tampering period, the time when teams are allowed to talk to other UFAs to be and uh, agree to terms, but not sign any deals. So, you know, whenever you hear that a player signed with a team, that quite hasn't happened quite yet because all they're really doing is they're talking, they're agreeing to terms. And um, from there, we see what happens. You know, most guys go through with it. And most guys do not. So we're going to talk about what the New York Giants did. Now, it was a little touch and go there. I know a lot of people were frustrated by the pace of what the Giants were doing early on. But ultimately, New York did make some moves. And uh, we'll talk about some of those moves and um, guys what they want, they picked up and guys that they lost. Ideally, if you're looking for a theme as to what the Giants did, the first day of the tampering period, they focused on beefing up the run. They signed former Colts inside linebacker Bobby OKRK uh, for four years, 40 million. Now, this is a guy who has good sideline to sideline range. He's a run stuffer. You're going to hear a little bit coming up on the show. Uh, we're going to hear from Jake Arthur of Lockdown Colts. He's going to give us the lowdown on OKRK. Um, what his strengths are, his weaknesses, where he would be a fit in this defense. The Giants also added defensive tackle Raheem Nunez Roches from the Bucks, three years, twelve million with seven point five million guaranteed. Um, again, a run stuffer, a uh, little bit of a pass rush to his game, but uh, primarily a guy who is depth. I mean, after the Giants didn't have things work out with uh, Justin Ellis. Nunez Roches, a.k.a. Nacho, as he's as his nickname is, is considered an upgrade. So uh, David Harrison is actually going to be on the pod as well, telling us about uh, uh, Nacho, David Harrison from Locked on Bucks. So we're going to learn more about those two players coming up. But primarily for the Giants, it was all about beefing up the run, the defensive interior, which is what we expected. You know, the inside linebacker position, very thin prior to the signing of Okiarke. Um, the defensive line, very thin, that depth, um, you have Leonard Williams, you have, uh, you know, Dexter Lawrence and, you know, behind them, you have a bunch of guys who are either injured or just aren't coming back, you know, DJ Davidson injured, Nick Williams injured, and who knows if he's going to be back Ryder Anderson. So, um, the giants putting a focus on the run defense. So, um, that was one of the themes. Another theme was addressing the kicking battery. So the Giants re-signed um, long snapper Casey Kreider, which I'll admit was a bit of a surprise. I thought they might look to upgrade there, but they did get um, Casey Kreider back on a, uh, a short-term deal. Um, I think it's a veteran minimum is what, what uh, they got him back on. So Kreider uh, returns. Um, they got J- Jamie Gillian the punter back on a two year, 4 million deal with an additional 1 million in incentives. Those are tied into individual performances, net average, gross average and kicks or punts, I should say inside the 20. So Gillian is back. Giants not really willing to give up on his strong leg. And I know that surprised a lot of people, but you know, in fairness, I think one of the, actually there's two things behind why the Giants brought Gillian back. Number one, he is a lefty and you know, the left, when a ball comes off the foot of a left footed punter, it gives the team a, a decided advantage. But, you know, you look at the inconsistencies that Gillian had, you know, the lack of touch and whatnot, and ask yourself, did he really have a good gunner, you know, supporting him? I would say probably not. 
So I think if you're the Giants, you want to get somebody who would be a really good gunner to help Gillian out. Now, I'm not saying that Gillian didn't have his share of, you know, shanks and clunkers coming off his foot because he did. I also think, you know, sometimes the long snap from Kreider was a little on the slow side, but uh, the Giants clearly wanting to stick with their kicking battery. And so Gillian and Kreider back on uh, contracts, Gillian, the two-year deal, Kreider, a one-year deal. Um, The Giants re-signed offensive lineman Wyatt Davis, one year, $823,000. Davis is a, um, or was to be an exclusive rights free agent. You know, not a huge signing there. Matt Breida, running back, re-signed for one year, 3.2 million plus incentives. I like that signing. Breida, to me, I thought was underutilized last year, but when he was on the field, I thought he was pretty good you know, certainly good enough to do what the Giants needed him to do. So he comes back for the New York Giants. So basically, you know, the Giants put more of a focus on retaining guys that they had on the team last year, which is something that Joe Shane said that they were going to do. They did beef up the run defense, uh, at least on paper, uh, with the additions of Raheem Nunez Roches, a.k.a. Nacho, and uh, inside linebacker Bobby Okearke. So uh, we'll see how that all falls into place and what roles they're going to be asked to play. Now, as far as day two goes, now, uh, I don't know what the Giants have on tap, but there is something that I, I feel we need to talk about for day two. And I don't think that, um, you know, is really being discussed a whole lot. Now, the Giants, as I record this, according to Over the Cap, they have $12.813 million in effective cap space. I do not know, um, and I will check. Let me just check real quick. But I don't think that includes all the signings that they did today because we don't have all the numbers in. So a couple of things the Giants need to make decisions on over the next day. Number one, what designation are they giving to Kenny Galladay, who will be cut on Wednesday? Kenny Galladay, if he is a pre-June 1st cut, Giants will save 6.7 million in cap space and they'll take a 14.7 million dead money hit, which is, you know, the way I think they're going to go. If Galladay is a, um, a post June first cut, the savings goes up to 13.5 million with 7.9 million hitting the dead money ledger this year. And then another 6.8 million hitting next year's ledger. I think even though it's tempting to take into the summer and preseason and regular season, 13.5 million in salary cap space, I can make a case for two things happening. All right. And the second thing I want to talk about kind of ties into this. I think Leonard Williams still has that 32.26 million cap number. That number needs to come down. All right. So 18 million is the base salary. He's already got a prorated bonus of 14.26 million. The Giants. If they extend him, they can lower that 18 million base salary. Now it will add to the prorated bonus, but that being said, it'll help reduce that cap number and it'll give them some cap space. So who knows? Maybe they say to themselves, okay, you know what? If we can get a negotiation done with Leonard, an extension, maybe the 6.7 million that we would save with with Galladay will cover that and we'll have enough to get through, you know, what else, you know, whatever else we want to accomplish. And then we can afford to take the 13, you know, we can wait till June 1st to to, uh, accept the 13.5 savings on Kenny Galladay. So those are the two big decisions I think need to be resolved by Wednesday. Joe Shane needing to make those decisions because basically that's going to influence how much money he has. Now, I don't see Shane spending like crazy. I think the big ticket item was the inside linebacker. I don't anticipate there being any more big ticket signings. Now, could there maybe be a trade? I mean, I think there had been, there were reports that the Giants were looking into maybe acquiring one of Denver's receivers that are supposedly on the block, but that's going to cost them draft assets. So we'll have to see what happens there. Um, There's also the matter of, you know, who are they going to get for center? You know, the Giants lost Nick Gates. He went to the Washington Commanders. Um, now, John Feliciano, as of this recording, still not signed. They do have Ben Bredesen who could play center. But gosh, I wish they would get a center in the draft. 
But if they can't get a center in the draft, who knows, maybe somebody will shake loose. You know, would, for example, um, I think the Titans set their center free. Um, name escapes me, but I think he's available. Um, might the Bills part with Mitch Morse at center to save some salary cap space? That could be something to keep an eye on if they do. I mean, I, I would expect that if Mitch Morse becomes available, I could see the Giants pouncing on him, you know, the Shane Dable Buffalo connection. But, you know, we'll see if he shakes free and that becomes an option for the Giants. But still a lot more to be done for Joe Shane as they, you know, gear up for the official start of free agency on Wednesday. And we, of course, will keep you posted with shorts here on the YouTube channel, as well as our daily wrap ups on the Lockdown Giants podcast. All right. So coming up next. I have Jake Arthur of Lachlan Colts. He's going to tell us about new linebacker Bobby OKRK. And then after that, we're going to have David Harrison of Lockdown Bucks, who's going to tell us about Nacho. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. Hey, Giant fans, the NFL season might be over, but the NBA season is in full swing. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 if their first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to the spread and more. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Hey, Giant fans, thanks so much for making the Locked On Giants podcast your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, make it the Locked On NFL Draft podcast. Damian Parson and Coach Keith Sanchez provide in-depth coverage of the biggest NFL draft prospects with deep dives into the sleepers and hidden gems that can change your favorite NFL franchise. Find Locked On NFL Draft wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. A very busy day for the New York Giants. And uh, on the previous segment, we, of course, spoke about how the Giants addressed the run defense. So here to help me break down what the Giants are getting from former Colts inside linebacker Bobby Okereke, I hope I said yeah. that right, Got is it. Jake Arthur, co-host of Locked on Colts. Jake, thanks so much for hopping on the pod with me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Jay, tell us what the Giants are getting in Bobby Okereke. Yeah, you guys got a good one. It was a bummer that he couldn't come back to the Colts. And really the only reason uh, he wasn't coming back to the Colts is because Shaquille Leonard's already making almost $20 million a year. And you just can't have that much tied up into the linebacker position. Um, but, no, he's a really good pass defender. And he's played in a variety of different schemes. Uh, he came from the Vic, Van the Vic Fangio tree when he was in Stanford. Uh, he's played interior linebacker in a 3-4 scheme when he was under Chuck Pagano for uh, the one year. Um, actually, take that back. Um, that was Anthony Walker. <laughs> but no, he uh, he has played in a variety of schemes. He's played all three of the, uh, the base 4-3 schemes, Sam, Mike, and Will. He's looked pretty good doing all of them, actually. Uh, I talked to him after the season and he said that he's comfortable everywhere. Um, he really coaching was going to be a, a big factor for him where he goes. So he must already have some sort of familiarity with, you know, Wink Martindale or whoever your position coaches are uh, there in New York, but no, he's, he's a good one. He's uh, lengthy. He can go sideline to sideline. Uh, he's really instinctual as well. Although he uh, excels more as a pass defender, uh, he's the type that can sniff something out and just kind of shoot the gap and make a play in the backfield as well. Uh, but no, he's he's a playmaker. Um, he's a guy in practice. You see him. The ball always seems to be around him. So uh, you, you guys are, are getting a really quality defender. Now, I also saw where in coverage, he's also lined up in the slot and also a cornerback. Just, you know, kind of putting a stamp on the fact that the Giants mm -hmm. want 
versatile players on defense, you know, so that they can line them up. Wink Martindale, a defensive coordinator, often calls this defense a positionless defense. Mm-hmm. Um, those times when Okereke has lined up as a slot or as an outside corner, how has he done from what you remember? Yeah, so it's just kind of based on matchup, whether it's a, a tight end or a running back. And, you know, he wins some and loses some, but he's got the range to stick with those guys on, uh, you know, a curl route going down the, the sideline or uh, the circle route. Um, he's al- He always seems to be in the right place at the right time, even if he doesn't win the matchup and, and someone makes a catch over him. He's always right there. So he's he's really experienced in that area, um, moving him around, like you said, in the slot. Um, he can hang with, with some of those, those tougher guys in a, in a division that features a guy like Dallas Goddard, that's going to be pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. What weaknesses does he have in his game? How, how should the giants not use this guy so as not to expose a, a weakness? Yeah. So he's, he's a pretty well-built guy, but his play strength and ability to shed blocks could probably be a little bit improved. Um, it's funny because they drafted him right after drafting Shaquille Leonard and they had a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so if, if you get that guy kind of mixed up in the wash, you could probably take him out a bit, uh, because he's not the best at disengaging from those blocks and kind of the hand combat and getting off of those things. So, uh, if, if you get him out and free and where he's got room to run and, and again, go sideline to sideline, he's going to be really good. Uh, But if you're just kind of making him compact and play in the trenches constantly, uh, that's not really going to play to his strengths. But uh, he's a real rangy, explosive guy, and he's usually going to be able to find his way out of those scrums. What is his best position of, you know, you mentioned he could play all over, you know, any of the linebacker positions. What's his best one? Uh, The one that we probably see him play most, you know, most free and really excel is as the 4-3 will linebacker. Uh, he's capable mentally and, and both physically of doing things well as the Mike. He kind of had his his welcoming party there in 2021 under Matt Eberflus. Uh, but having to fill in for Shaquille Leonard and, you know, play a lot more will this year, that's really where he excelled. You know, getting, you know, staying off the ball, uh, not having to engage as much in blocking, like I mentioned, and allowing him to just play free. Uh, that's that's going to be his best spot. Will linebacker is really uh, that's really where he's going to shine. What about as a, as a locker room leader, or locker room presence? What type of personality is he? Oh, he's got a really good head on his shoulders. He's you know he's really well spoken and just he he's always thinking about what he's saying. You know what I mean? He's he's not he's going to shoot it to you straight. You know some of the players will kind of give you coach speak answers as well. Um, he'll he'll give you a good answer, but you know kind of put it in a pretty package. Uh, But no, he seems to get along with a lot of the guys really well, takes coaching very well. Uh, Like I mentioned, I had spoken to him right after the season and, and the coaching was going to be a big thing. Uh, He grew really close to linebackers coach, Rick Smith, uh, the Colts current linebackers coach. Uh, He was always a very big fan of Matt Eberflus and that scheme as well. Uh, So he's a very coachable guy. I, I, I really can't wait to see what Wink Martindale does with him. Because uh, again, positionless defense. He he wants defenders who can be multiple, and I'm, I'm excited to see what Okereke is going to be able to do there. He, of course, I guess impressed the Giants last mm-hmm. year in that Week 17 game. I think he was, if I remember correctly, wasn't he the Colts' leading tackler? I think he had 17 tackles in that game. Yeah, he was all over the place there near the end of the season. Him and Zaire Franklin were just kind of neck and neck when it came to tackles, but he finished with 150 on the season, and that doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, and that was his second straight 100 plus uh, tackle season, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I believe he had about 120 or 130 the year before, uh, first year as a full-time starter. So the guy will put up some stats. Yeah, definitely. And of course, you know, you mentioned the run defensive part of it, a big problem for the Giants last year. And it just seemed like for the New York Giants, the first day of free agency was to shore up that run. And Mm -hmm. it sounds like Okereke is, is a guy that can, you know, come up and fill some of those run fits that the Giants just struggled with last year. Yeah, and he's he's really good finding those those creases off the weak side to to just kind of shoot shoot through there and, and get to the runner. It's not his forte. Again, he's better as a pass or a, in pass defense. 
Uh, but he's he's no slouch there either. He's really one of the young up and coming linebackers in the league. All right. Well, the Giants sound like they got a good one. I'm curious mm-hmm. to, to see, you know, what he has to say. I'm sure once it's official um, and he signs, they'll put him on a conference call. And of course, to watch more of him uh, when, when he does get into camp, the Giants start up in the spring. Jake Arthur of Locked on Colts, co-host of Locked on Colts. Thank you so much for hopping on with me to give us some lowdown on the Giants newest inside linebacker. Of course, have fun with them. Thank you. Coming up next, Giant fans, don't go anywhere. David Harrison of Locked On Bucks is going to tell us all about another run stuffer, Raheem Nunez Roches. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hey, Giant fans, the Built March Madness bracket is here. We know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know, I'll be voting for the Mint Brownie Puff. So which bar or puff will you be voting for? Support your bar or puff at BuiltMarchMadness.com and be automatically entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built and one lucky Locked On fan will win a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to their door. Vote every day in March and don't forget to pick your favorite Built bars or puffs at 15% off on your first order with the promo code LOCK15 at built.com. All right, New York Giants fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Traina. A very busy day today for the New York Giants. After starting off a little bit on the slow side, they picked up. And they address the run defense. You just heard from Jake Arthur of Lockdown Colts, who talked about the new inside linebacker, Bobby Okarike. And now joining me on the podcast is co-host of Lockdown Bucks, David Harrison, who's going to tell us a little bit about the new interior defensive lineman the Giants agreed to terms with, Raheem Nunez Roches. David, welcome to the program. I appreciate you, Pat. Thanks for having me. And uh, congratulations on getting someone who's going to be very fun to talk to. I can tell you that. I have heard that he is a trip to talk yeah. to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, energy guy. That's what I mean. We, you know, affectionately referred to as Nacho. Uh, Rakeem Nunez Roches, Nacho is the, the nickname. Um, that That's what you're getting from. He's, he's a ball of energy. I mean, he's an undersized defensive tackle in the National Football League. And you can't have a career. I mean, what he's going on what year nine, I think this will be for him. You can't have that long of a career if you're not just a dude that brings uh, maximum intensity. We always talk about change of pace backs uh, in offenses and in running back rooms. He's almost like a change of pace defensive lineman, usually coming from uh, the interior. But honestly, if you're creative enough, you could put him uh, on that edge if you really want to. Again, not a, not a, not a, not a bendy guy, right? So you're not going to get that quick off the line bend, wrap around the offensive tackle and get a sack type of thing. Um, but, you know, certainly certainly an effort guy and an energy guy in the locker room that's going to make sure the guys are definitely do, doing their work if they're not. All right. So tell us a little bit more about him. Where What are his strengths? Um, he, the scouting report that I've gotten is he's a run stuffer, but he can also, you know, rush the passer, as you said. But he's yeah. primarily a run stuffer. How has he been deployed mostly while with the Bucks in, in that run stuffing uh, capacity? Has he been an inside guy, a zero technique, one technique? Where, where's they used him? Yeah, he's definitely an interior defensive lineman. You know what I mean? You don't really ever see him lining up over the tackle. Usually you're inside the guard shoulder or lined up directly on the guard, depending on how they really align other uh, guys. And with Todd Bowles, there's there's no one answer to that question, right? But you, what you what you never see him, oh, well, I guess you can't say never. We've seen a safety lineup. Uh, as the nose guard or the nose tackle for a top bulls defense. So I guess can't say, say never see Nacho line up as the nose, but typically, typically you're off the center, usually in that a gap, that B gap. And as a pass rusher, the problem with Nacho and his size is if he doesn't win right off the line of scrimmage, just boom with that quickness, there's not a whole lot there. He, there's not like a, like you talk about speed to power or bull rush. There's not really a lot of that there. And again, never say never. So occasionally you can see it, but as far as relying on him to consistently be that guy, if you're looking at him as a pass rusher, he's either got to win immediately or he's not going to win at all. Now, the good thing with him is that he, again, he's very active. So if you have a quarterback that's trying to move around a little bit, if he can find an angle or if your quarterback runs your blocker out of the block for you, he will take advantage of that. And he's also very smart, very quick to try to get his hands up in the passing lane 
if he sees that the quarterback is about to pull the trigger. Now, as a run stopper, that's where his athleticism and his energy really kind of helps him. Holds up well at the point of attack, doesn't really get knocked to the ground a whole lot, and then he's really smart in how to read the offensive line blocks, how to read what the opponent is going to do. Uh, I think he's more of a cerebral pro- player than maybe he gets credit for, just probably because of his his attitude, honestly. like Usually you see the guys out there kind of having the most fun. You don't typically associate them with the most study, uh, studious or or book smart type of football player. So I think that's where that comes from a little bit. But you watch the instincts on the field and the way he manipulates his blocks and gets off of them to try to help in that run stopping business. That's like you just said, it's amazing because you look at Vita Vea and he's such a monstrous type of human being. And then you look at Raheem Nunez Rochez and Will Golston. Will Golston's your taller, longer type of guy, and Nacho's just your smaller energy guy. But those three guys together really kind of helped the Buccaneers run defense be one of the best in the NFL for the last three years. What about um, in terms of, you know, when it comes to blocking, you know, some guys just absorb blocks, some guys get washed out. What, what is Nunez uh, Roches more, more, where does he fall more so? Yeah, because of his size, obviously he can get pushed out. You know, if you have an offensive line that likes to throw multiple linemen at a guy when they're pulling, or if he gets caught unaware from a pulling guard or a swing tackle or something like that, then, you know, he, he can be susceptible to that. I think it's kind of fair to expect that. But for the most part, if we're talking about holding up at the point of attack, he's a guy that understands leverage. He understands where he can win with leverage and where he can't win with leverage. He doesn't really try to do the things that he can't do, right? Like he's not, he's not going to be Tom Brady trying to run for a first down on a third and 12. You know, we, we, uh, you don't, you don't like to see those kinds of things. He knows what he's capable of doing. He knows where he's going to win best for his team. And that's really kind of what he sticks to. So you're not going to see him just get completely manhandled, but at the same time, he's better at clogging the lanes and, and holding where he's supposed to hold to keep the offense from doing what they want to do, get to the next level, prevent those offensive linemen from getting to your linebackers, things like that. Um, than he is at getting that specific penetration on his own. So more of a, of a cog in the, in the machine, so to speak, than he is the exact playmaker. Were you surprised that the Bucks didn't try to keep him? I don't know that I was surprised that the Bucs didn't try to keep him because their, their priority even coming into last off season was really getting that upfront pass rush going as best they can. I mean, Todd Bowles is one of the best in the game and dialing up uh, a seven man front and getting pressure with seven or eight guys uh, in the box, you know, and that's where you get some of this weird stuff of safeties lining up over the center and, and things like that. But he also understands that really at the end of the day, your defense, you want to be able to get to the quarterback as organically uh, as possible. And in a three, four base defense, you're looking at your three down linemen. Yeah. You have the two stand up outside linebackers, but you want the ability to drop them off in coverage. You, you know that, and, and, you know, smart football fans know that as well. So you really want to get home with that front three to five guys. If you can, without having to rely on blitzes and exotic schemes. And again, Rakeem Nunez Rocha says just by himself doesn't really provide that for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But then you look at the run defense and a lot of what Todd Bowles likes to do in run defense also involves the safeties and linebackers, off ball linebackers, filling their fits uh, appropriately and on time. And that's why they were so attracted to a guy like Devin White who can click and close uh, with the best of them when he's on his game. So from that aspect, it didn't surprise me just because if you sign Nacho and you keep him in the building, that's less money you have to go get maybe a penetrating defensive end or even an even front uh, backup defensive tackle that you can put in there next to Vita Veda to shoot that opposite A gap uh, while he, you know, Vita eats up two or three blocks by himself. You mentioned that Nacho is, is a ball of energy, you know, just yeah. also wondering, you know, in, in the locker room, you know, there are guys who are energetic and who, you know, kind of give off the wrong type of vibe, but how, how does he kind of mesh with the younger guys, because I, I imagine the Giants are going to add some young depth, additional young depth to what they already have. They, of course, have Dexter Lawrence, who's still kind of young, but he's a veteran. They've got Leonard Williams, who's been around, but they're, you know, they also got DJ Davidson, who's a young guy, Ryder Anderson. They're going to probably add another guy. What kind of a guy, how would Nacho take to that kind of role, kind of like a mentorship role? You know, it's it's actually it's actually a little bit kind of it's kind of weird because if you were just watch him on the playing field, you kind of assume he's kind of a class clown type of guy. I'm not saying that there's there's not definitely a, a kind of a grade of that to him. But when you look at him, like specifically on the practice field with the Buccaneers, you know, it's it's a little bit weird because with Bruce Arians coming in, you almost kind of expected a little bit more of a traditional type kind of stereotypical football atmosphere. Where there's a lot of music. There's a lot of jokes. You know, me wrong. There's a fair share there, but there's also a very business like atmosphere. And then even going to Todd Bowles, Todd Bowles is a little bit more of a coach's coach than he is a player's coach. So you still kind of have that. But at the same time, 
you have a very supportive kind of element to, to that room. Uh, Benning Potai is, is a defense tackle that played for the Buccaneers. He had to actually end up with the Washington Commanders this last season. So I had some conversations with him of kind of going from Tampa to Washington, Washington, a little bit more of a laid back, uh, jovial type of atmosphere. And they like to have fun while they do their work where Tampa was a little bit more reserved. So if you're asking him to be kind of that mentor professional type of guy, like he can fill that role because that's kind of what he's come out of is this more business like football at- atmosphere. But amongst that football, that business atmosphere that Tampa's kind of adopted, he's one of the guys that has the most fun. So it's, 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 you know, it's a, it's a unique blend of, again, bringing that energy and bringing that fun to the game, but also taking care of your business. Now, I think you touched on this a little bit before, but, you know, if you were scripting the ideal role for him in this Giants defense, what wouldn't you want to see him doing? Uh, I don't want to see him being kind of a guy that I'm going to trust to, to, to swallow a gap all by himself. You know what I mean? So if you're, if you're in an odd, if you're an even front, then you can move him inside, move him next to a guy like say Dexter Lawrence, who's already going to kind of dedicate you know, the opponent's going to dedicate a lot of work to that guy. And that kind of gives him more of a one-on-one type of opportunity. And you can use that size a little bit to your, to your advantage. But if you're in odd fronts, uh, especially like a three-man front, you don't want to have him kind of assigned to a gap all by himself. You want to use him as more of a role player, a facilitator of, you know, Nacho's going to do this. He's going to hold his point of attack here. He's going to hold this gap or he's going to hold this lane, keep this guy from being able to break off of him. And behind him, we're going to bring in, you know, uh, I can't remember his name. It's Kayvon Thibodeau. Like we're going to bring Kayvon Thibodeau behind Nacho. And then, you know, Nacho meet him in the backfield for the celebration. And you'll think Nacho got the sack from the way that they're celebrating. But in reality, he's just there to kind of facilitate. If the, if we had assists the way that the NBA had assists uh, for sacks, then you'd see Nacho is, is definitely one of those guys that fills up the, the stat box there. And I think that's really the best way to use him is, is understand that he's best used to facilitate the movement of others around him then he mm-hmm. is to be relied upon to be a guy that's going to get you the highlight plays by himself. And he's primarily a rotational type, right? Like maybe, right. I don't know, 60% of the snaps, maybe 40. I mean, yeah. what, yeah, 40 what, what sounds 60. about right? Yeah. 40 to 60 is about right. I mean, 60 on a good day. You know what I mean? If, if you face a team that has a lot of run uh, run fits to them, like, I mean, honestly, the Washington commanders, right. Let's let's do a little bit of a crossover here. The Washington commanders, you expect a little bit more run. Uh, from them, even with Eric Bieniemy, a lot of people look at the Kansas City Chiefs and say, "Well, that's 66% pass." But you got to remember, Eric Bieniemy is a running back by by nature and a running backs coach by nature. So I think you are going to get kind of more of that 55 to 60% run out of the Washington Commanders. So when you look at Brian Robinson, you look at Antonio Gibson, Nacho is the kind of guy. If 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 you know, honestly, if I'm if I'm combating the Commanders offense specifically, if B Rob isn't in there, I'm putting Nacho in the middle along with a guy like Dexter Lawrence, so, so that he can hold again that point of attack, hold his his fit and allow other guys to get into their fits and potentially stop Brian Robinson in the backfield or the line of scrimmage. If it's AG, I might start Nacho inside, but I might stunt him outside and and use a little bit of that smaller size and a little bit of that quickness to my advantage to force AG back inside where he doesn't do the most damage. So kind of kind of one of those things, again, kind of a chess piece that, piece that if you use properly against your opponent uh, a good amount of time, then you'll he'll he'll make your other stars shine brighter. David Harrison of Locked On Bucks, thank you so much for the intel on Nacho. I, th- I think I'm going to call him that if he's yeah, that's that. what we call him. We call him Nacho. That's what you know. Press conferences, locker room, everybody calls him Nacho. So I don't know All if right, I've ever I'm, heard I'm anybody actually that. call him Rakeem or Nunez Roaches. Nacho, he's he's comfortable with it. All right, that sounds good. All right, David, appreciate the feedback. Giant fans, thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of the Locked On Giants podcast. We'll have plenty more the rest of the week, day two of free agency coming up. I'm sure there'll be some more transactions. We'll have it all for you, as well as shorts on the YouTube channel. Be sure you check them out. For Jake Arthur and David Harrison, I'm Patricia Chan and Giant fans, we will see you tomorrow.